Hi YouTube, off the back of our tanking guide video that's gone down so well with all of you, thank you for all of your fabulous feedback. Um, I thought I'd move on to some more advanced comments. This has really been driven by uh, a couple of the feedbacks that you actually gave me, YouTube. You actually gave me some really good thoughts and I thought, well, that would be good to include in an advanced tanking guide video. And it will allow us to do a deeper dive on some of the very specific subject matter that we didn't really get a chance to because the video was already an hour long. Um, and I was really keen not to make it any longer. I've already had some feedback from people saying I should do short, more clickbaity videos. I really don't want to do that. I kind of really enjoy the long form content. That's not to say everyone out there. I do want to highly recommend two YouTubers in particular, The Core Gameplay and Fusion Thunder. Their videos are excellent. I've put their links in the description below. You should definitely go and check those guys out. But uh, anyway, let's get straight into the advanced tanking guide video. Okay, so the first section I want to talk about is armor and what kind of armor you should be running. Well, obviously there is heavy armor, right? That was what's clear from the normal tanking guide video. If you haven't seen the tanking guide video, the card is in the description above you. I highly recommend you go and watch that first before you watch the advanced tanking guide video. Don't worry about the length of the video. Um, it's all individually chaptered. You can skip to whatever part you want. Please don't feel like you're obliged to watch the whole video. Just go to the sections that you really, really think you would benefit from. Um, but of course, as a tank, you should be running heavy armor. And that goes without saying, no matter whether you're doing PvP or PvE content. Um, I guess the question then is, is all heavy armor created equally? Well, no, it's not. And you might not know that, actually, folks. So let me just um, scroll all the way down here. We can talk a little bit about it. So you can see here in the heavy section, I have heavy or aura heavy. OK, I can also get fur lined and I can also just get normal orichalcum. OK, and I wonder if those um, those of you watching right now know what the difference is or have spotted the difference. Well, let's compare gauntlets across all three pieces. OK, so orichalcum plate, fur lined orichalcum and orichalcum heavy. Each one of these produces a 551 to 560 because I haven't got my armor and trophies. They've been lent out to someone else and I haven't got all of my armor and crafting gear on, etc. But you can see here the gear score is exactly the same. They use the same amount of resources as well. In fact, no, they, no, they don't. Def, don't be an idiot. These ones cost a little bit more runic. These ones cost a little bit more of the primary metal that you'd need, which is going to be Asmo, really, if you're crafting. And these cost the same. OK, so just a slight movement, a bit more metal needed for the for these ones. And the reason. When I talk about these ones is I want you to focus here on these numbers, the armor rating. Okay, So if we go to the armor plate gauntlets, you can see here that in both categories, physical and elemental, they offer a fair split of between 260 and 248 for both categories. That means there's a 50-50 shared ratio there between these two armor categories. That's what changes when you come to the fur line. With the fur lines, you get much more elemental resistance at the cost of losing some physical resistance. And when you come to the Orichalcum Heavy, it's the opposite. You get more physical resistance off and at the cost of elemental resistance. So what does this mean for you? Well, I, I really think it depends on what kind of content you're playing the most. For me, I'm playing PvP the most, and I'm mostly playing war content in particular when I'm playing my tank. And so for that reason, I tend to have more of a more of a slanting towards Orichalcum heavy gauntlets because in war, especially when I'm on the point, it's mostly physical damage I'm receiving. That's not to say it is always that way, because at the moment with the ice gauntlet perk, for those of you who don't know, Ice Storm is a little bit bugged right now and giving massive DPS increases. Um, but realistically, I think that I tended to be coming across physical damage the most. Which is why when you look at my gear set, this is my PvP dueling set you're looking at here rather than my tanking set. Let's go to my tanking set for you right now. You can see on my tanking set, I'm running Orichalcum Heavy, Dryad Guard, which is an even split. We'll talk a bit about that in a moment as to why you might craft Dryad. Uh, Orichalcum Heavy, Orichalcum Heavy, or and oh, just reinforced boots, actually. So these are these are basically like um, Orichalcum boots. So an even split. And if you come down here, you can see your split between physical and elemental. So you can see that I have much more physical resistance, 2261 versus 1609. And that plays out in damage resistances in those charts there. So what you should be doing, folks, is you should be looking at your performance in whatever particular area you're going for and identify where you keep dying. So one of the things that I did actually was I identified that I was dying through mostly elemental damage. Because in 1v1s, I would win normally against bruisers because I could tank their damage. I was so heavily slanted to physical, but mages would wipe the floor with me because I was just sucking up so much damage. 
I mean, 1v1 jewels, there's not much you can do to offset that if you play the normal rules of most servers, which is no potions and no other, de and no other buffs. Um, but in wars, or in small-scale PvP, when you're doing um, territory pushes or territory defences or OPR or whatever, you can offset that. And there are really two items that you need to know that offset the kind of damage mitigations you might be worried about. The first one, which offsets your elemental weakness, is gemstone dust. There's different categories of gemstone dust, okay? You can get weak to powerful, tier 5 being the most. And, but powerful gemstone dust, if you read the tooltip here, increases absorption of elemental damage. Think of that as you get more elemental resistance by 35% for 20 seconds or until damage is received 15 times. Um, the cooldown for it is a per two minute cooldown. But of course, you should be running refreshing toast on it to get this to get this cooldown even faster. This is a massive offset. So what I will do is when I'm thinking about war and I can realistically taking the two items that we're going to mention, one gemstone dust and one something else. If I know that elemental damage is my weakness, I'm going to be taking gemstone dust to offset my weakness. The other option is the oak flesh bombs. Again, you get weak to weak to powerful. Oak flesh bombs increase absorption of physical damage. Think physical damage resistance in the same way. So this item, if you think you're suffering against physical damage or you think your opponents are more physical damage, then you want to be taking in oak flesh bombs. You think you're suffering to elemental, taking gemstone dust. Um, you can craft oak flesh bombs at the, at the armory, uh, earth quintessence, water quintessence, and oil. You can see he don't make very much money on them just because earth and water quints are about 60 each. So you know, by the time you craft it, you don't actually get much of a margin there. But gemstone dust is crafted at the armor as well, but you have to have dual crafting up to 170 for powerful gemstone 120. So do it a bit like honing stones or oak flesh bombs in terms of the leveling that you need. Um, I think it's 70, 120, 70 for um, common, strong, powerful in that order. You should be taking whatever that's killing you the most. And of course, there's another way to offset the kind of damage, which is the gems that you use. So at the moment, I mean, I've mostly have, I still to, to this date, mostly have onyx gems, cut pristine onyxes, and those offer me physical damage resistance as well. But there's no reason why you have to use onyxes. Again, if I feel like I'm struggling a little bit, I could put in their opals or malachites. And let's talk, let's have a look in the stone cutting section so you can see exactly what they do okay so onyx gives you the most physical resistance at 2.5 the opposite to the onyx is the opal which gives you the most elemental resistance at 2.5 and then in between you have two options diamond gives you 1.9 and 0.63 elemental respectively so a split and the other one is the malachite which gives you 1.9 of elemental to 0.3 of physical so again if you feel like you're lacking in a particular area you can offset that with some gemstones just to give you a bit more resistance. And I do that in my PvP build. So at the moment in my tanking build, it's mostly physical because that's what I feel like what happens to war. But if you look at my PV, um, sorry, my at my dueling build, I mean, I have a diamond in my wardens, guys, a diamond in my boots there. Um, I keep an onyx in this gemstone here and I have a diamond in here. So I still have more slanting towards physical, but definitely more elemental damage resistance than I do for war content. Okay, and then we want to talk a bit of a deeper dive on jewelry. I don't think jewelry got enough focus on the tanking guide video. So there's a number of different perks that I think you should be looking out for, and some that I think are best in slot, and some that I think you could probably do without a little bit. Um, I do want to mention something that I forgot to mention on the tanking guide video. I, I mentioned ill-gotten gain, but I didn't mention how you get it. You actually get it from Foreman Harold. You have to farm this guy, Foreman Harold up here in Eden Grove, and um, Foreman Harold is in the lower slag mine. He's a boss. I think he spawns about every two minutes. He spawns pretty quickly. I kid you not, I got super lucky. I got um, ill-gotten gain, I think, on my second Harold Foreman kill. Yeah, I've heard of people take, spending much, much longer in there, but take your luck gear in and try your, try your best. The reason why ill-gotten gain is so good is despite it only being 499 gear score, it comes with, realistically, two of the best perks you can get. Refreshing Toast, which is potions cooldown, happen 25% faster. I cannot tell you in war how important that is. Um, 25% on that two-minute cooldown for elemental, um, sorry, for oak flesh bombs or gemstone dust turns that into 1 minute 30 on an already 20-second cooldown. And then I have to only wait 50 seconds between potions and when you really think about it, um, is so much, much faster. and massively life-saving and not only that that applies for all of your potions as well so you can spam health potions regen potions cleansing potions i mean in war i'm nearly on a constant rotation of potions so that is fantastically effective uh, the second one is regenerating which i would say in pve content is probably best 
because it just allows you to regenerate your health over time. PvP content, it's very, very good. There are a couple of other perks that I prefer, and we'll talk about those. I think the best one, if I'm being honest with you, I think the very best perk that you really need to have as a tank is Hearty, which you get on your ring. Now, the reason Hearty is so good, we did explore a little bit in the last video, but Hearty gives you this 9.5 more max stamina, and I'll show you the, the diagram on the screen that basically shows you how you can get, I think it's about 160 effective stamina if you manage it correctly. Um, stamp, why do you need stamina as a tank? Well, st stamina lets you do two things. It lets you hold up your shield for block, which is massively important because it means you can block damage. Um, and it also lets you dodge. So if you do those two things, you'll stay alive longer, which is why Hearty is one of the most important perks you can get. Um, there's one on the earring as well that I really, really like that unfortunately I can't really find too much. Um, it's not stamina recovery. Let me find out which one it is. Yeah, it's nimble. Uh, nimble, if you can see that in the bottom right of the screen there, 9.3% stamina region. This gets your stamina back faster. I really, really want this. I would like an earring with refreshing toast, nimble, and something like refreshing ward, I think would be fantastic. And we'll look at refreshing and refreshing ward in a moment. Um, but nimble, just for more stamina region, for obvious reasons, the longer you keep your stamina up, the more you survive. Stamina is as important as your health bar as a, as a tank. Enough said about that one. It's 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 fantastic. Uh, to me, it's it's the best in slot. Again, nimble and hearty, and, and that combination. Sorry, not not, not hearty. Oh, it is hearty. Yeah. Nimble and hearty is, is a combination that's going to be so so powerful. And if you get a six hundred gear score item, you can improve your refreshing toast from the ill gotten gains twenty five percent up to a maximum of twenty eight percent. And as we move up to six hundred twenty five gear score items. And hopefully that goes up to 30% as well. So 30% reduction in potion time is absolutely outrageously good. PvE perspective, you could think about taking Despised for generating more threat. In reality, I think as long as you take the right weapon combination, I, I feel like Despised is a wasted slot because there shouldn't be any problem holding aggro if you can cycle between the taunts that you can have on two different weapons. So to me, it's a really wasted slot. Now, that might be a little bit controversial. I know some people really, really like Despised, but in reality... I don't think it's necessary. And I don't think it's necessary for the reason I mentioned that you can cycle through taunts and you should be able to hold aggro in that way, especially with sufficient cooldown reductions. And that moves us nicely onto the refreshing versus refreshing ward combination. Because on your on your earrings, you can get refreshing. And why is refreshing good? Well, refreshing gives you a 2.8% cooldown reduction. Doesn't sound like much, does it? Well, actually, if you have that across all of your pieces, you can stack those in combination. So Potentially, you can get that across five different armor pieces. You can get it on your shield as well, and you can get it on. You can get it on the ring, the earring, and the amulet, which is a sizable chunk cooldown reduction. But there is another option out there, so you don't just have to have refreshing. There are a couple of refreshing options. One that I'm not going to cover really too much today, and the reason I'm not going to cover it is about to become told to you: refreshing evasion. Refreshing evasion reduces your cooldowns by up to a maximum of close to 1% after exiting the dodge animation. Why is that not great? As a tank in heavy gear, one, your dodge isn't fantastic. Two, you don't really want to be dodging too much. You're better off with your shield up. You only want to dodge. If you remember in that diagram, when you get down to about one stamina, that's the time to dodge because you get that free dodge that should cost you 50 stamina. It's very expensive to dodge. In reality, you're going to be standing there with your shield up far more than you are going to be dodging. And so for that reason, I don't think you'll get the most out of Refreshing Invasion in comparison to, say, a spear user with light gear who has so much stamina recovery and going to be dodging all the time. They'd get so much utility out of Refreshing Invasion, but a tank really wouldn't. So to me, I think Refreshing is the better option. But there is one more, and that's Refreshing Ward. Refreshing Ward gives you a 1.9% cooldown reduction after being hit five times. How does that pair up? Well, again, it stacks across all of your armor pieces, and that's this can drop on all of those things as well. And of course, if you think about having your shield up, you've got hit, you're going to get hit lots and lots of times, especially wearing heavy armor as well. You can tank all of those hits, even if your shield gets broken. And what that means is if you get a lot of hits really quickly, you're going to get massive cooldown reduction really, really quick. So if 2.8% cooldown reduction is over something like Defiant Stance, which has a really, really slow cooldown reduction, 1.9% five times, and you can get hit so quickly in a short space of time in war, I think you get more utility out of Refreshing Ward. And I have tested it in Scenario. It is, it is faster with a, with a sufficient number of hits. So you have an option. Um, when you come into PvE content or PvE content or 1v1s or small-scale PvP, I would probably choose Refreshing. 
If you're talking about PvE content where there's lots of ads, like an elite run, or you're talking about PvP content like war, where you're going to be facing lots of enemies in close um, combat, I think Refreshing Ward gives you that little bit more mileage. So those are the two things you need to be thinking about taking on your armor slots as well. Okay, and then one of our friends in the comments section gave me an absolutely fantastic tip that I hadn't actually realized myself. So this was good knowledge, probably because I haven't played healer at all in this game. And he's a healer. He or she is a healer. And the comment I made was around how powerful Divine was. Now, what's Divine? Divine is a perk that gives you, at 600 gear score, 9.5% more, more health from all incoming health effects. And this is a really good perk because it helps with things like your orb on your Void Gauntlet, if you're running Void Gauntlet, or your Defiant Stance. It does help you obtain more health, which is really, really nice. However, the main objective of something like Divine, of course, is to help your healers when they pop a Sacred Ground or they're spamming heals on you to heal you fast. And if they can heal you fast, it keeps you alive longer. So that sounds good. Except what I didn't know is that your heal, your heal bonus, if you will, let's say your healing is capped at 100% right now. And when you get disease, that lowers it. And when you have Divine, that increases it. Or well, the increase is capped at 50%. So you can only get 150% healing. Now, there is a perk for Lifestaff users that will already increase them up to that max of 150%. And it's taking Blessed on Sacred Ground. So what you can see here is when allies are in Sacred Ground, they healed for 50% more from all healing. Sacred Ground is one of those, especially in war, is taken a lot. And I feel like most healers run Sacred Ground. Healers, let me know in the comment section if I've got that wrong there. But when they're running blessed, they already go up to the 150% max. So unless you've taken disease, which is going to knock you back down again, and divine could offset that, then you're going to lose the benefit of divine standing in sacred ground for that reason. So what could you take instead of divine? You could take something like health. Health gives you 9.3% more maximum health. And you can actually get both of those things. So you can see on this amulet here, you can get divine and health. And that sounds like a really, really powerful combination for tanks. Health gives you 9.3% more maximum health. And I think I recommended in my tank guide video last time, running around 300 con for most activities. That's what I tend to do. A tank's objective is to stay alive. People would say you can run 200 con and go for it. Um, depending on the activity, of course you can. If you're trying to speed run Genesis, you probably don't even need a tank. You probably just need five DPS. However, if you're talking about the kind of activities I'm talking about, which is mostly war, then you want 300 con as an absolute minimum, which is going to give you about 16,000 health. Or well, running the health perk with, let's say, roughly speaking, 10% more maximum HP is like 1,500 health points right there. Um, that's a really, really substantial number that can keep you that can keep you alive in certain scenarios. That's an extra hit you can take. So many healers will run Blessed on their Sacred Ground and already cap you at the 150%, then Divine is somewhat wasted, whereas health will never be wasted. Those 1,500 health points are always going to be valuable to you. So for that reason, I probably value health a little bit more higher than I value divine. Okay, then there's a couple of options you can take. If we're looking at a bis amulet slot, there's a couple of actions that you can take here. Um, fortified is one of them. I really like fortified for a tank. Fortify me, uh, fortified gives you the buff that your fortify, you apply lasts 14% longer. Now, of course, when I run my tank build, and I think I've mentioned about this before, if you're running something like keen and keenly fortified on your sword, you've got all of the fortified skill tree perks, um, you're going to be getting a lot of fortification and having that last 14% longer is really, really powerful. So I think for a tank build, that's really, I think for a pure, pure tank build, fortified is probably um, one of the best um, perks you can get. On top of that, there's something that has maybe a little bit more utility. Not if you're, because I mean, look, if you want to go and buy something like this, that's that, I mean, that's 40K right off the bat, right? It's very expensive. Um, this one's 75K. No, I, that should never be 75k anyway. It's overvalued. But there is a perk on there that I do want to talk about, which is stamina recovery. So when you're below 50% stamina, you get 95 stamina just as a straight boost. And it does have a 57 second cooldown. It doesn't trigger off persistent damage or damage over time effects. But what this means is potentially you've got your shield up, you have to drop it for whatever reason, and you get hit, bang, instantly 95 stamina. That means shield can come back up. A really, really expert tank player could use that in war so effectively just to buy them some time. Imagine how skilled a player you have to be to think, to have the wherewithal in a really intense environment to drop the shield, take the hit, get the stamina recovery, put the shield back up. That is S tier tank play right there. 
So I really, really like stamina recovery. Do I think it's better than fortified? No, is my gut feel. I think fortified is easier. It has a lower skill ceiling. And for that, you know, I, I help shot calling wars. So for me, I'm not sure I'd have the time management to really think in depth on stamina recovery. And fortified would just be an easier thing for me to manage. Potentially, though, this is the higher skill ceiling and could be even better if you used it super effectively. There is alacrity, which gives you haste. You're not going to be applying too much haste. I think that's a bit of a dead perk. And you can get some other things like thrust protection, void protection, arcane protection. I mean, take those, I think, as all as secondary. To me, the best option would be something like fortified health divine. If that role is even possible, that would be the best. Or fortified health and something like Refreshing or Refreshing Ward would be really, really powerful amulet to buy. On the ring side, you have lots and lots of options. Rings tend to be a bit more offensive than defensive, but I mean, we've spoken about Refreshing or Refreshing Ward already. Um, I really, really like Hearty. Hearty is absolutely key. It's the S tier perk. And then you've really got room for one other, and what could you take? Well, there's Crippling, which means your slow applies for longer. Um, there's the one that means your disease lasts for longer, which I really, really like because if, for those of you who, know, who don't know, I main Void Gauntlet in my offhand and I'm going to be applying Putrefying Scream and I also have Plagued Crits. So I'm applying quite a lot of disease. And for that reason, I really like the one where my disease lasts even longer than that. Infected, here we go. So to me, Infected is a really good perk, but it depends, it depends on your play style and you need to think about what you would rather for those things as well. And then there's, of course, Keen Awareness, which is extra crit chance, which does stack with Keen. But I, as a tank, you're not going to be outputting much damage. Why do I like keen awareness on my ring? Again, it's to proc plague crits more often because it allows me to get more crits. Um, so there's lots and lots of options here, realistically speaking. But just bear in mind, these are quite offensive rather than some of the other things like amulets, which are defensive. And you just need to spec into what you're really running. If you're running Warhammer, then obviously infect is not going to work for you, but slow might work for you or something like that. And a final option is sacred, which increases your outgoing healing. If you're running void gauntlet again and you're running the orb of healing, you could run sacred just to increase your hills a little bit. The hills aren't going to be massive. Um, sacred apparently does help you with your defiant stance as well. You can check out Fusion Funders video. I think you check things like that. If that's the case, then sacred could be a good option as well. And finally, on the earring, my bis earring would be Refreshing Toast, Nimble, and Refreshing Ward. Okay, so then one other thing to think about is where, what's going to happen in terms of using our stamina as effectively as we possibly can. So the diagram has always been there. Uh, we've shown you that a couple of times in this video. But my friend Fusion Thunder, he actually had a really, really fantastic suggestion that didn't get any airtime in the last video, which is, well, when could you keep your stamina up or when's the right time to use particular actions to get the most out of your stamina? So, There's some ways of managing your stamina, right? So if I just dodge here and use my stamina up, you can see that when I stop attacking, stamina goes up. But also when I keep attacking, stamina also goes up and they go up at the same pace, whether you're not attacking or attacking. So what can you do about that? If I need to manage my stamina to get the most out of it, I need to put my shield down to recover stamina. I want to put my shield down when I've got the most fortify and the most physical or elemental protection I can possibly get. And there's one skill here that really is going to allow you to do that. And that's Defiant Stance. Defiant Stance increases your base damage from attackers by 30%. On top of that, when you have this option and your health is above 50%, you get 50% damage reduction and then the heal at the end. So what does that mean? Well, <clears throat> ideally what that should mean is I should keep on blocking and when my stamina gets to say one, I drop and dodge, okay? That'll make me use that 149% stamina that I was talking about. And then from there, I've got to let it recharge, okay? Because I've spent all of my stamina. What can I do? Well, I'll proc Defiant Stance then. And now I can, one, when I proc Defiant Stance, what you'll actually notice is it starts to recover your stamina anyway because it counts as non-attacking move, which is really good. I already start that stamina recovery. And secondly, at this point now, I've got massive damage reduction, 50% damage reduction. And that means, and also if I get Fortify on top of that, it's increased damage reduction. It's absolutely huge. This is the time when I want to be managing my stamina the most and not attacking. So you need to be using Defiant Stance and then thinking Defiant Stance is my way to get stamina back. I pop Defiant and I stand there and I tank some damage now, but now I can get it. And then Defiant starts to wear off, but my stamina should be back and now I can put my shield up. Okay, that's the cycle. So if I show you that again, Defiant Stance, all my stamina has already got to 50 from 9 just from popping Defiant Stance. So really, really powerful. And so that's a really, really good perk. Now, there is a perk in a skill tree as well that you can also think about taking, and that is 
invigorating bulwark, which you gain 15 stamina flat when you use shield bash or shield rush. I don't think this makes it into my main build, even though you might think, well, why death? That's a really good way of managing stamina. So, of course, if I just do a shield bash, I haven't taken the perk there. But Ezra, if you didn't know that, if you look there again, when I use the the when I use my abilities, I do start to get stamina recovery. So not only with something like shield bash or shield rush, I'm getting stamina recovery. But if I took invigorating bulwark, I'd get a nice 15 bump. Now, why don't I use that? It's a good question that you could reasonably ask. And I'll explain why I don't use that. And the reason I don't use that is because I like to use a void gauntlet. And there's a specific thing on void gauntlet that I need to make you aware of that I don't think we spoke too much about last time. And it's on the oblivion skill. Okay, so on the Oblivion skill was really here, invigorating. So I think we had invigorating bulwark just then. We've now got invigorating Oblivion. Plus 15 stamina per second for self while inside the radius. So get my stamina all the way down, pop this, watch my stamina get bumped. You see that? It goes down, I get that 15 bump, another bump, another bump. Right? You do that. It's gone now. With the shield up, you, you literally see your, your stamina going down as you get in here, and then bam, bump, 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 every single time just from Oblivion. It's such a, an amazing combination, right? Look at that. Look at the bump down there. It kind of completely offsets all of the hits you get. And then you combine, combine that with Defiance Dance as well when you get really low. Your stamina recovery is absolutely through the roof. Um, it's such a good combination, and, and a good tank would know when to do that. Now, realistically, when you're capturing, capturing a zone in war, that's the time to do it. You want to pop that Oblivion, stand there, get that tanking ready, use the shield, shield bash if you need to, just to buy you some time, and then pop your Defiant just to give you that survivability, get your stamina back, get your shield back up, and survive for as long as you possibly can. Um, I really, really like that combination. I think that's a high tier combination. That's why it's made itself into the advanced guide video. Thank you to Fusion Funder for that really good tip. And then we had a good tip from our friend Jesse Lucas as well, who also spoke about a build where you took Shield Bash and Shield Rush and Defiant Stance and Invigorating Bulwark. So what could you do there? Well, it would really work, I think, in single target fights where you haven't got too much to manage because it would mean losing reverse stab, which I'm not a massive fan of because I really like tactician, especially in large scale combat where you can hit more than one target. Because this, as I've already explained, can get you full cooldown reduction on one hit if you hit tar four targets, right? But if you take bash, rush, and invigorate a bullet, well, you get 15 for each of those, right? So, I mean, if you think about it, let's pop that on the tree there. So, in theory, what would happen is you would you would have low stamina, you'd Bash, you'd rush, hit both of those targets, and it will give you a 30 stamina bump on top of also using the action, the ability itself, which also gets you a stamina buff because it doesn't count as having your shield up. Okay. Now, the reason why you're not seeing the bump on your screen right there is when you see the tool, the tooltip, sorry, invigorating bulwark, gain 15 stamina when hitting a target. Out here, I'm not hitting a target, so you're not seeing anything. But in reality, if you're hitting a target, you get a nice stamina bump. And that is a really good tactic against single targets. And it's particularly useful in the Arena Spriggan fight, which is a really stamina intensive fight. Um, Jesse made his excellent point as a way to keep your stamina up. And it would, again, pair really nicely with Oblivion just to give you that additional stamina bump. That would be a way to almost keep your shield up quite a lot of the time. OK, and the last point, the last tip I want to mention in this advanced guide is we did cover in the tanking guide video the possibility of using Ice Gauntlet in quite an offensive way. And we spoke specifically about using Ice Storm. Um, the problem with Ice Storm as Primal Predator, um, which I'm not a massive fan of that username, um, pointed out to me, which is Ice Storm doesn't stack. Although I have come to learn that it can stack. So if one person has Ice Storm and one person has Ice Storm but has Unending Thor on their armor piece, then it counts as two different Ice Storms and those can stack. So technically speaking, we can stack. But in war content, if you have a lot of mages running Ice Storm, realistically, you're going to get a maximum of two stacking. So do you want yours to be one of those ones that count on the point to stack? Realistically, no, because you're not going to be running nearly enough intelligence to make it worthwhile. Really offensive mages are going to out damage you so much more often. But where could you use this? Well. Not only does this cause damage, but it also creates a frosted area that slows enemies in it by 25%. The slow is where it really comes in. So where could you use Ice Storm? Actually off the capture point. 
by using Ice Storm off the capture point, you can slow people coming in, which buys you more time to capture it. And I thought that was a really fantastic idea, really nice perk to think about there from the advanced guide. If you can have a couple of tanks, by storing the zone around the point, slowing people getting in almost, you know, to the point where they can't get to the point, it's going to buy you more time and help you manage it. And not only that, what's really powerful in this game is the big AOE impact, something like Maelstrom, something like a really powerful Ice Storm. Um, being able to group people up by slowing them down and then letting your big, heavy DPS users blast them is a really effective way to wipe out an enemy team. So I thought that was a fantastic idea, Primal Predator, and one I'm certainly going to be thinking about in my upcoming videos and upcoming wars. And of course, you could combine this with the slow perk on the ring, which makes your slow last 14% longer as well, just to get a bit more utility out of this. So there's probably a couple more tips that I'm missing, but in all honesty, I don't want to make this as long as a video as last time. I think we're giving you a lot of information and I want you to go and practice. If you have any more tanking guide guide tips out there, people, please let me know in the comment section. It'd be really good. We got a lot of mileage out of the comments that came in last time. and I'd love to do an update if people have got some more helpful information. You can, of course, drop into my Discord where we talk all things New World and especially trading. And, of course, you can drop into the fastest growing New World Twitch stream at the moment. Twitch stream link is in the description below. But until next time, everyone, hope you enjoyed the video. Stay safe, keep rocking, and see you soon.